Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Winning Social Media and Content Strategy for Your Law Practice, presented by Tim Barron. My name is Stephanie Phelan. I'm a marketing manager at my case and I will be your host today. But first I'd like to give you a few tips about participating on GoToWebinar. The webinar control panel is on the right hand side of your screen. This is where you can control audio, chat with me and submit questions. Please use that questions pane to submit your questions all throughout the webinar. I'll be collecting those questions and saving them to ask Tim at the end of his presentation, but please don't wait until the very end to shoot those over to me. Also note that these slides and the recording will be available by end of day tomorrow on the MyCase blog and we'll email that to all the registrants. When you close out your webinar today, a five question survey will pop up. All you have to do is answer those five questions and you'll be entered to win a $100 Amazon gift card. The survey will only take you about 30 seconds to complete, so definitely worth it. And if you'd like to join the conversation on Twitter, since we're talking about social media today, the hashtag to use is hashtag law firm social. This webinar has been approved by the Wyoming State Bar and the Florida Bar for one hour of general CLE credit. If you are a Florida Bar member, note course number 2713R to self-report your CLE. Please note we do not provide certificates for this webinar. Today's webinar is hosted by MyCase, so before we jump into things, I'd like to give you all a quick overview. MyCase is web-based law practice management software that takes care of your daily practice requirements for calendaring, contact management, document management and templates, time and billing, client communications, custom workflows, and more in one solution at an affordable price. My case is priced for solo and small firms at just $39 a month per user. We also offer My Case websites for our customers. The one-time fee to set up and build your custom website is $9.95. Then there's a $50 a month per uh, $50 per month fee to maintain and update your website. Our websites team makes some really beautiful websites and they can build one for your law firm too. We use a modern professional design specifically for your firm. The websites contain social media and blog integrations and best of all a client portal which is completely integrated with your MyCase software. So now you and your customers can log into MyCase directly from your own website. Next up is payments. Are you accepting payments from clients online yet? If not, don't worry, it's easier than ever. My case now has built-in credit card payments feature for our payment service. My case customers can accept online payments from clients using both credit cards and checking accounts seamlessly through their My Case account with no third-party integration required. Last but not least, we enjoy hosting educational events for professionals in the legal industry, and that's why we're all here today. So let me tell you a little bit about our presenter. Tim Barron is the Chief Marketing Officer of Good To Be Social. Tim's two decades in the legal profession has taken him from law firm library director to legal tech startup to legal marketing. He was named to the 2016 Fast Case 50, honoring the law's visionaries, techies, and leaders and is passion, a passionate advocate for access to justice. Tim lives in New York City, and I've heard that he just signed up for an improv class at a local theater, and he's more than a little bit scared. So good luck with that, Tim, and uh, thanks for being here today. I'm excited to hear about your social and content strategy, and I'll pass the mic over to you now. Awesome, thank you so much for the privilege and the honor of being here. I've known um, since we've practiced um, or hang, hung out in the same practice management space for many, many years. I know a lot of the folks at my case and um, I'm friends with them. So it's a super pleasure to be here. And I've been hearing a lot about um, how improv can improve your, you know, I've been speaking a lot, I'm now doing podcasting, how it could improve your, um, the way you speak, the way you present. So as a matter of fact, there was just an article the other day that came out that attorneys should definitely take an improv class. It is definitely not in my wheelhouse. So I am a little um, like freaked out by it. So we'll see how it goes though. All right, so we'll 
We'll um, do a couple of polls during this presentation. And the first one I wanted to get right off the bat because I wanted to know, you know, in addition to breaking up my droning on, just to give me an idea and to give you and each other an idea of who's on the call. And it can help me tailor, tailor what I have to say to be most effective in addressing whoever um, is on the call. So here are, here's the first poll. And please choose if you are a solo, if you're a member of a two to five attorney firm, a six to 10 attorney firm, 11 to 25, and then 26 or more. And I sort of said that a little bit slowly to give everyone a chance <laughs> yes. to actually take the poll. Is that, was that, was that okay there? Perfect, Tim, yes. <laughs> and um, everyone's actually, looks like the majority has voted. So I can go ahead and close the poll and we'll get our results right away. Awesome. Here it goes. Okay, so how big is your firm? The majority is solos. We have 42% uh, with us today are with solo firms. 24% are with firms that are two to five. 9% in firms of six to 10 attorneys. 13% are 11 to 25. And 13% also in those larger firms, 26 and above. So definitely speaking um, to quite a range there. So we're speaking to quite a range, but we could definitely see that the top of the um, the the polling there are the majority are solos to about five attorneys. But I'll be speaking to everyone on this because if there's one thing I wanted to stress about this presentation is how to keep things simple, right? So let's get back into this. There we go. Um, so this is the agenda. I may have gotten a little. Uh, a little crazy with some of the shapes and sizes that PowerPoint provides. But this really, for me, pointed to a exactly what I want to talk about. Because that arrow, everything that I talk about, starting from a documenting your content strategy, to developing a social media plan, to building a thought leadership platform, it all points to the ultimate, which is growing your firm. So very quickly, I'm going to do another um, another poll. So I think we have three. So this is poll number two. And before we get into the content strategy, I just want to know what kind of content you produce, right? So it'll allow me to talk a little bit more about either blogging or eBooks. Um, it could be either white papers. Um, a really popular way of producing content that's um, that's going on right now is through podcasting. I've gotten all um, caught up in that. By the way, I'm, I listen to a ton of podcasts. If anyone wants any recommendations for a podcast, shoot me an email, Tim at, um, at good to be social or Tim at TimBaron.com. All right, so you can choose multiples here, right? You can choose blogs, eBooks and white papers, webinars, podcasts, and of course there are a lot of other ways that you can produce content. Um, so if you could go ahead and choose that. Okay, great, thanks. And if they don't do any of those, should they select other maybe? So you know what, oh, so there is an other on there. Yes, you can, yeah. you can um, uh, choose other. You know, initially on this poll, I had, um, one of the choices was I don't produce any content. But you know what, I took that out because we all do, regardless of what, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're, on the, if you're creating a practice area on a website, if you're presenting uh, during a webinar like this, or if you're, whatever you're doing, you're producing a piece of content. Okay, great. Um, all right, everyone's pretty quick to vote, Tim, so I'm going to go ahead and close the polls mm -hmm. and share our results. Okay, so what content do you produce? 47% said blogs, that's impressive. 10% um, ebooks and white papers, 9% produce webinars, 5% are doing podcasts and 61% fell into that other category. All right, so I am loving that 5% podcasting because we did a poll, a similar poll um, a couple of years ago and that was 1%, right? So, um, so people are starting to discover the value of podcasting. And again, if you, if you ever wanna to talk to me about that, just shoot me an email, I'll talk your ear off. 
So one of the things that law firms have gotten pretty good at in recent years is producing content. So this survey was taken by a Green Target and another organization just a couple of months ago. And in it, one of the things that was most startling for me was seeing that law firms are not only producing um, um, a ton of content, but in in, even though in-house counsel, which are the clients of the law firms, even though they're saying that they are drowning in content, there's too much content, there's content overload, law, firm, law firms, lawyers, marketers are plan, plan on producing even more content. 75% of them lack a document, documented content strategy. Do you think that's the reason? Here is a breakdown of that um, survey. If you look at the, uh, all the way at the bottom, so the green, the light green are the results from this year compared to the darker bluish hue from last year. And you can see there's improvements across the board. But at the bottom, even 6% said we have, not only do we not have a content strategy, we have no intention of creating one. So where is the disconnect? We keep producing content. There's so much content out there. It's content overload. So we know that it's obvious that documenting a content strategy is part of the problem. But where is the actual resistance? And I wish if I had another poll about how many people on this call have a document content, documented content strategy in place. I would posit, and just based on anecdotal evidence, that it's just too confusing or even bewildering. I mean, if you ask 20 marketing experts, 30 marketing experts, what a content strategy is or what should be your content strategy, you'll probably have 20 or 30 different answers. So my goal today here is to clear out that bottleneck by keeping things as simple as possible. I could not resist this quote. You know, if the fellow on the right, as you probably all recognize as Einstein, if he said it, I'm good with it. So we're going to try and make keep things simple here so that when you're done with this, there are some actionable items that you can take away and start creating a content and social media strategy um, so that you can see results. The first thing we want to talk about when we talk about content strategy is why. Ask the question why. Why are you producing content? Why are you writing? Why are you speaking? Why are you doing videos? Why are you doing podcasts? If you focus just on these three primary reasons, you can refer back to them every time you want to create a new piece of content. If it doesn't fulfill any one of these goals, then put that to the side. Note, note that um, the last two there are, or I should say the bottom two, get new clients and generating revenue, right? Getting new clients is also generating revenue. But in addition to getting new clients, part of your content goals, and the reason why I split that up from into getting new clients and generating uh, revenue is that existing clients, you can upsell, you can cross-sell, you can create applications, um, uh, maybe a, a piece of technology, you can switch up services, you can add another service. These are all things that, you, that, that, that becomes part of your content strategy, including and especially at the beginning asking the question, why? So if you are really interested in content, I mean, that's my sort of sweet spot. And I love, I, I love content. And as a, as, a, as a content guy, one of the first pieces of advice I give to a lot of folks is don't produce so much content, not before you have a strategy in place. And that strategy might dictate that you produce even less. So Content Marketing Institute is a great resource um, if you want to check it out. Um, subscribe to the, their blog. Every day you'll get some, um, some really, really useful information from them. So they cr um, created this chart. I came across this chart that they created. And they talked about, as you can see, brand awareness right, um, and, en and engagement. And if you look at the last 
four, that's all about um, getting new clients, which is lead gen, and generating new revenue, right, which is sales, customer retention, uh, et cetera. But what I'd like to suggest is instead of looking at metrics like this as page views or website traffic, Look at it as people visiting your site. So one of, one of the problems or one of the, one of the concerns I hear all the time is, like, how do I build my, um, my traffic? I, I, I don't have enough people coming to my website. Think about this. If you only have 30 visitors a day to your website, that's 30 people reading your stuff. That's 30 people looking at your videos, listening to your podcast, um, reading what you have to say. When you think about creating content, speak to them. I mean, in, if you think about it in another way, if those 30 people came around to your office every day looking for advice, you would be super happy. And look, it's, it's always great to see uh, traffic numbers spike or go up. But these are all largely vanity metrics. So unless you can tie traffic to your website, the number of users to your website, to the number of leads that you connect, and you find a correlation there, then it's important to increase traffic, right? And that, we'll talk about that a little bit more um, later. So a lead can be anything from submitting a form for a consultation to signing up for a newsletter, anything that requires um, someone submitting a, and their, their name and email address. The next thing to ask is who. Now, if you speak to um, um, marketing marketers, oftentimes they refer to this as buyer personas. But they often want you to create like incredible detail. Buyer personas can get very detailed, even giving them names such as this is Sally, and this is the buyer persona I'm going to create for Sally. This is Robert, and this is the buyer persona I create for Robert. And that's all well and good, but for solos and small firms and even legal vendors who are just startups, it can lead to just a bottleneck again, like, like just paralysis. There's just too much information for me to gather. Look, when you grow enough to hire a marketing agency and they can go deep with this, it's a useful exercise. But for now, just think about who your target audience is. And remember that the more niche your practice, the more effective this exercise will get, right? So you want to think about demographics. If you are like, is it um, a? If you have a family law practice, if you have a divorce um, uh, practice in that in um, practice area in your divorce law firm, if you um, family law firm, if you have um, child custody, right? You want to think about the demographics. What are their needs? Like, what are the problems they're trying to solve when? they search in Google for you, or they ask a friend if they can refer someone or if they know anyone um, that they can turn to for help. What is their objective? So what is, meaning, what, what, in addition to their problem, what do they hope they, to, to get out of seeing a lawyer, right? You need to know that. Where, what are their behavior patterns? What, where do they hang out? Do they, are they online mostly? Are they offline mostly? Do they, are they in Snapchat or Instagram as opposed to the big Facebook and Twitter? You need to know these things because that's where you will try to concentrate your, concentrate your efforts on. If you're not sure of where to start, start with your client and then work, work your way backwards. So, a good exercise is to write down every question your client asks from the moment they contact you as a prospect. I can't stress this enough. If you, if you make this a habit, the information that you gather over the course of weeks and months and years will be invaluable. And in terms of, besides just a content strategy, it will be invaluable just as a business objective. Um, because what you will find is a lot of the things that you thought were important or that were necessary or that you wanted to speak to or that you wanted to create a practice area around may not be the things that, are, that people are looking for, may not be the problems that people are experiencing and looking for help with. 
So one of the things I do is before every meeting, if I have to hop on a call with a phone um, on the phone or um, or or even meeting someone in person, I would open up my laptop or or, or open up my Evernote on my phone and I have a meetings folder, and then I open up a note in that meetings folder and that note. Um, I, I have naming convention, so the, the naming convention would be so that, just so that it appears in order. It would be uh, two thousand and seventeen dash oh seven dash thirteen, and then the name of the person, and then as they speak, I start typing. After that, for these purposes and for this exercise, you can open up a spreadsheet, let's say in Google Docs or a Google spreadsheet in Google Drive, and and start identifying commonalities. So um, if someone says X is my problem, X is Y is my problem, Z, and then you and, and then you start to enumerate them, right? So and then you say, whoa, over the course of a month, over the course of a year, we I have five times as many inquiries or questions about this particular, and it doesn't only have to be their the problem that they're experiencing um, in, in a legal manner, but about the process that you go through in helping them. Right? So the questions that occur, the reason why they call you during the course of your helping them. This is a really great habit to get into. So we talked a lot about documenting. Right? So I just talked about Evernote. I just talked about, um, about Google Docs and Google Spreadsheet. We talked about the why. We talked about the what. Make sure that you document them. Without documenting them, as this, this uh, pithy saying goes, a goal unwritten is just a wish. If you don't document them, you don't have those guideposts to refer to along the journey of, your, of creating content and of trying to um, build relationships and try to grow your practice. Now, next comes the what, right? So we've talked about the why. We've talked about who, but how do we do this? So let, let, if you think about it, think about strategy. It's, there, there, there are different thoughts um, in marketing circles that, oh, you really have to separate content strategy from content plan, social media strategy from social media plan. And it's, it all sort of goes together. And the only reason I'm, I'm, and I like the idea of just having a content strategy slash plan and just having it all in one document. But it's a good exercise to think of content strategy as your why, because you can always refer to that. Just why are you doing this? And then think about what as your content plan. How are you going to implement this? What platforms are you going to use? What are the topics that you're going to cover? Um, like. How often? What's the frequency of creating content? Which platforms will you use? Um, and we'll go into these in a detail right now. So the one thing that should govern all of your content is to speak to your clients, to speak from the perspective of your clients, to speak to the concerns of your clients. Instead of, this is what I do, this, just talk about the problems that the clients are facing. Now, we already talked. You've already done a lot of this work, right? At, at every meeting, from the moment someone contacts you, you already have a spreadsheet with all of the questions. Make sure that you talk about those issues. Another way to think about creating or identifying topics is check out what your competition is doing. Look, you will, because they're probably going through this exercise also, and maybe some things may resonate with you, other things will not. But trust me, you'll be able to recognize the meaning, meaningful stuff and the fluff immediately. You can, in addition to thinking about what each blog post or each podcast or each webinar can be about, what two-minute video can be about, you have, with these 
questions, a perfect opportunity to create what can be a super vibrant, well-trafficked page on your website. And that's a simple question and answer site. That page becomes a destination for anyone looking for answers to that topic. And you can then use that. This is, this is sort of your strategy or your plan right out in the open, right? Over the course of time, you've, create, you've come up with 20 questions, 25 questions, 30 questions, and you have a little pithy answers to each of those questions. And then in those answers, you have a hyperlink to a blog post that expands on each of those answers. And in, and in that blog post, you have another link that takes you back to the rest of the Q&As. That's called internal linking. And let me tell you, Google loves that stuff. It builds authority to certain pages on your website. And then Google recognizes that and moves you up in the search engine. So are you a strong writer? Maybe you prefer video. Maybe you, you hate the camera, but you love speaking. Or another word for podcasting. In the old days, that was radio. Um, these, these are just some of the primary content formats that you should think about when you're, think, when you're uh, putting together your content plan. Now, video, I, I, I do want to point out that video is something that everyone is talking about today. Just um, earlier today, we put out a blog post on Good To Be Social. If you go to, if you go to goodtobesocial.com, and it, it's two with uh, the number two, and look at our blog, the latest blog post up there from today is about video for lawyers. And a couple of stats that really threw me um, were video has 135% higher organic reach than photos, than photos on Facebook. More than 8 billion people videos are watched on Facebook every day, and 10 billion on Snapchat. And it goes on and on and on. So even if you're not comfortable on video, this is one of the other reasons probably I'm taking this, um, this improv class, is that it allows you to be a little bit more um, uh, intuitive and um, impromptu when you, talk, when you shoot videos. Get a, find out ways that you can get a little bit more comfortable on videos. Videos don't have to be um, a 10-minute diatribe on something. Just a 30-second, you know, a, a two-minute video tops. Don't make it more than two, two minutes. But you should really think about adding videos to your marketing mix. I get asked questions a lot. How often should I blog? What should be the size of my blog post? Um, yeah, what about posting on Instagram? And what about um, on LinkedIn? And I think people get too bogged down about what is the right number of posts to put on your blog or on Medium? Or what is the right number of updates that you should have on Twitter and on Facebook? And it's not, a, it's not a magic number that you can come up with. It really is based on your individual circumstance. I will say, though, that you, the one thing that you should be is consistent. right? So if you put out three blog posts today or in one week, and then you wait two months before you put out another blog post, that's not good. Um, uh, Google doesn't like that. People that are coming to your site doesn't like that. Um, you, if someone is trying to follow you in a podcast, or you know, they want to see some consistency around that. That's how you build an audience. So if you can, it's not a bad idea to plan on creating a piece of content, regardless of what that may be, um, at least weekly. and then. Assess, meaning see if this fits your availability, the time that you have, the, um, the resources that you have available. So if you, for your blog and website, I mean, seriously, if, stop wasting your time looking for the best platform and just go with WordPress. I think WordPress powers, I think it's around 25%. Of signs on the internet, um, sites on the internet right now, and and it's free. All you need is to register your do domain, have a web host. Um, I think they, they web hosts range from six five dollars to twenty dollars or more per month, and and then you connect 
uh, your there's a one click connection with a WordPress site, and boom, you get to produce as much content, blogging, websites, whatever it is that you want within the confines of this content management system. It's really, really awesome. So we'll talk a little bit more later about how you can repurpose content to each of these platforms um, so that you produce only once and then have the opportunity to really expand your reach by repurposing to other platforms. So we'll go into that a little bit more later. One of the platforms that I'm seeing more and more lawyers use is Medium. And I'm not, not, not sure if you're familiar with it, but you, if you're not ready to start a blog or, or have a website where you're writing consistently, then consider Medium. Check it out. Uh, there is a um, one lawyer that I follow. His name is Ken Grady, Kenneth Grady. He writes a lot on lean law, and he stopped um, writing on um, Sephard Shaw's uh, website, and now he has a Medium account. Um, I just saw an article from Ed Walters, who is the CEO of Fastcase, uh, the legal software and uh, the legal research software company, and more and more uh, writers I see are going to Medium. LinkedIn Publisher, I got to tell you, is something that you should definitely consider. You're already in LinkedIn. So in your feed, when you, if, when you go to add a link or create a status update, there is an option for you to write an article. And you just click on that. And it opens up this dialog box and with the, the option to, to create like an image that you can use as your hero image on top, a title. And then boom, just start writing. The beauty of this is that it's automatically shared to all of your followers, and not just your followers. If someone, if one of your followers likes or comments on it, it appears in their followers feed and so on. So it, it gives you an opportunity to really expand. If you're doing uh, video, obviously, Wistia, I didn't, I didn't put that down there, Wistia, Vimeo, YouTube. Um, if you're doing podcasting, obviously, I put stitches in there, but that's stitchers. I think that auto-corrected me. And uh, iTunes and, uh, and, of course, SoundCloud. And we are broadcasting right now from GoToWebinar. Zoom is also really good for both um, video and audio uh, uh, broadcasting, and for instance, for podcasts or for webinars. And finally, your content, content plan should, this is one of the areas where a lot of people fall short. You go through all of this effort to create a strategy and then create a plan and then produce the content, and then you put it out there, and you don't give your readers an opportunity to interact with you further. You need a call to action. Ideally, your call to action should have a form in it, an opportunity for whoever clicked on that link to fill out something, then they become a lead, which you can nurture over time, right? That could be anything from um, a consultation form, gated content could be anything from the, a webinar like this one to, um, to anything that, that someone has to sign up for. It could be an ebook or a white paper. Your services page should also, so if you have a, a practice area page, the reason why I put services page on there is at the bottom of a services page, you should always have a call to action. So even if all you're doing is linking to a page that expands on the topic that you just wrote about or that you just spoke on, then, and they go to that page, they'll still have an opportunity to get in touch with you and for you to be able to add them to your lead, to then nurture them through emailing and through newsletters and stuff like that. Now, putting it all together, this is also another bottleneck I, for some. Um, I've come across this a lot, and it shouldn't be. Um, this is actually really simple. I think the thing is that there's a lot of applications out there. I mean, there are a bazillion applications including WordPress plugins. There's one that's really popular called Trello, um, which is really boards where if you have a team of writers, 
It keeps them on task and it's pretty awesome. But my recommendation is that you simply use a Google spreadsheet. And in that spreadsheet, if we have time at the end, I might go out and show you some examples of this. But if you have a spreadsheet, um, if you're in Google Docs or you're in Google Spreadsheets, just create columns for each of these, the publication date, um, your desired publication date, the author if you have multiple authors, your keyword, your keyword is, or key phrase, right? Keywords can be more than one word, so that's called a long tail keyword. Those can be all of the questions that you've already um, put together from over the last few weeks, over the last few months, over the last few years. You have, you, you have a ton of keywords there, right? So you put those keywords in, and then you create a headline from there. What is your target audience if you have um, different practice areas, or if you have a practice area that you think um, uh, different people would find uh, more useful than others, um, you need to identify your target audience for a specific piece of content, for a specific question. Um, the call to actions that we talked about, one of the good things about creating an editorial calendar and putting that call to action in there is it's an opportunity for you to discover what you're missing. So you'll have these different um, questions by category, and you'll be like, you know what? I don't have a call to action for this. It gives you an opportunity to create that. The content type, meaning um, do you, is it an infographic, a video? And then finally, um, it's a draft. You can, you can update it with, with if it's a draft or it's published. Now, the next step for this that you can do is, and which I like to do, I just go ahead and put it into my editorial, um, create a calendar in my Google Calendar. So you know you can create, if you go to your Google Calendar, you have an opportunity to create additional calendars in there. Just create one called Content Calendar or Editorial Calendar um, and put all of these, whatever posts that you want, that you've assigned in your spreadsheet, put that in to your um, calendar. Assign a time for it, let's just say maybe 9 o'clock in the morning, or if you're a night owl like myself, you know, um, 10 o'clock at night. Um, so it alerts you, and then boom, you could get in there and you could start writing. On my phone, the, my only notifications that I have going are for calendars. Everything else is off. You know, Facebook, you know, social media, anything. I have even emails. I actually have to go into my email or go into my social media to see what's going on. The only notifications on are, um, are my calendars, calendar events. And that's the only thing that I need. And by the way, I highly recommend it. If you're being bombarded by, um, by notifications, um, because even if you have your phone next to you and a notification isn't coming in, just, the, just having in, there's been many studies, just having, having it next to you means that you're distracted from what you're doing. <laughs> it's not good. Um, all right, so that's, in a nutshell, content, right? We want to go into, let's talk uh, a little bit about social media. All right, before we do that, I, I do want to talk a little bit about um, curating. We talked a little bit about repurposing content, right? So for instance, if, um, you know, if you have a podcast, right? Uh, the idea for the podcast then becomes, or the podcast episode itself, it could become like a blog post write-up. Right? They're called the show notes. Um, top items from that post could be formatted into an infographic. Right? And let's say you have a series of episodes on a particular topic and a series of posts that came out of that, that can become an ebook with a little bit of editing. Now that ebook is behind uh, what we call a, um, like behind a wall, meaning that someone has to enter their email address or, have, or they have to enter their, um, their, uh, their name and um, primarily their email address, that becomes a lead gathering mechanism, right? If you use Skype for your, um, for your podcast and you want to add video to that, and it becomes a video and then it goes to YouTube, so, but you get the idea. It, every, you just have to produce one piece of content and all of a sudden you have the opportunity to spread it out all, in all of these formats increasing your reach, right? Because depending on where your target audience resides, you want to be able to reach them. 
And if you go into Upwork, you can, you can get someone to do a lot of these things for minimal cost. If you really want to go deep and you want to hire an agency, there are a lot of really good ones out there. The, the one thing I do want to say about curating content is ideas for blog posts can also come from articles and posts that others have written that you want to reference. It's a great way to build a relationship. And when you then go and put it out on social media, then you mention them in those social media posts, you get on their radar, they are grateful, they want to do, um, you know, re reciprocity is a thing, they will want to then um, uh, like have a conversation with you about, um, oh, what else can I do? Or maybe they may, might mention you, or maybe they might help promote your post. It's a really, really great way to build relationships. There are two tools I would highly recommend in order for you to, to curate. One is Feedly, so F-E-E-D-L-Y, and that's an RSS aggregator. And what it does, um, if I get a chance to after this, again, I'm going to show you how I do mine, is on your favorite blogs and websites, new sites, anything that you find consistent value from, have the content come to you. Just put them into these, um, add the URL into this aggregator, Spend maybe about 10 minutes every morning just going through it really quickly, and you'll be able to identify which ones you want to talk about, which ones you want to write about, which ones you want to tweet about, put on Facebook, mention that person by name, um, and get on their radar, build relationships that way. All right, so let's, I spent a lot of time on content, and that was purposeful because that, you've already done the heavy lifting, right? Now comes your social media plan. Before we do that, I'm going to do the final poll. And this poll, let's see, I'm, again, on this poll, I had at the end, um, I don't use social media, but of course that's not useful. Everyone does. Um, and if you don't, then for the, maybe the 1%, then you should definitely get on it. Uh, so the first, obviously, is Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Those are the big three, and everyone's on either one of those. And YouTube is, has now become an enormous, I think it's, it might be the second search engine after Google, an enormous opportunity, especially if you, obviously, especially if you're creating video. Instagram, depending on your, uh, on your niche, Instagram and Pinterest can be very useful. So, hey Stephanie, let's see the results of this thing. Yeah, definitely. So please go ahead and select your option there, and I will close the polls. Okay, here goes. And share our results. Um, so what social media platforms do you use? 83% on Facebook, 53% on Twitter, 81% are using LinkedIn, 28% on YouTube, and 26 on Instagram or Pinterest. That number actually surprises me for business use. So right. there you have so, it. That's pretty awesome. Instagram and Pinterest, I'm, I'm sort of excited to see that. 53% on Twitter, that's pretty cool. I, um, I've, I've had similar surveys where uh, Twitter has been below 20%, but people are obviously discovering the usefulness of Twitter, and I am very partial to Twitter because it's a you know aside from the noise, and I know it's become a um, it can be a cesspool of information, but um, and there are a lot of trolls on Twitter. But there, I tell you, your community is really based on who you choose to follow, who you choose to engage with, and it could be something super super meaningful. Um, so I you know for those for the forty seven percent that ha that are not on Twitter. I would say um, take some take some um, uh, baby steps into Twitter. Shoot me an email again, um, uh, Tim at Good to Be Social, Tim at TimBaron.com, and I will gladly run you through how I got into using Twitter in 2009. It took me a year um, after I first discovered it to really discover the value of it. Um, I just came across this article the other day from um, last week from Adweek of all places where they sort of confirm and, and, and emphasize what I try to say is that it all starts with content. And so you've already done the heavy lifting, which is content. 
right? Let's talk about relationships. Now, mind you, content and creating content is a big part of building relationships, but social media is where you really put that on steroids. And in the spirit, again, of keeping it simple. So strategy for social media can, can run the gamut, right? You can have, again, like a mind map with an octopus of information go, reaching out to every which way corner. In fact, I had something like that once, and I, and I had to, and I never looked at it again. Why? Because it was too overwhelming. So you've already created the content. You've already um, um, paid attention to things that are really important in creating that content, which is your strategy and your plan and actually creating the content. Now it's about like using that content creation and content curation that we talked about to build the relationship, right? And how do you provide value? You provide value by what we've just been saying, by Putting information on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on any of the channels, on Pinterest, on YouTube, that you've created, you know that's valuable. You listen. I think a lot of people do, do listen, but what they fail to do is engage. You're missing a golden opportunity. Just from Twitter alone, I have gotten so many opportunities to speak to, I've gotten job offers just from Twitter. When I, when I had my um, CLE consultancy, I got clients directly from Twitter. Someone, someone would discover me and, and someone would be asking a question that I'm not connected to. And, they, and then I remember one day before brunch on a Saturday, um, I got a tweet and then I used to have my Twitter not notifications on and saying, hey, contact Tim. And I'm like, who's this person? And there was someone that I knew that was referring someone else that had a question about the services I was offering. Um, and by the, but before I went to brunch, I you know, emailed the person and I had a client. It's, it's really important to, the other day I put out a blog post called um, The Power of a Like. Right? So if someone, if, if someone on Twitter tweets something and you like it, and you, just by clicking on that heart button, um, and it goes from empty to red, all of a sudden it triggers a bunch of different things, right? It puts you on their radar. They're like, who's this person? It, it, it goes to that reciprocity. Um, it appears in the feed again, because when you like it, it all of it, it appears in the feed as something that you like. Um, it's, the, it's the genesis of what could be a meaningful relationship. So here are a couple of, I wanna show you an example that, that happened just um, a month ago. I was on Twitter, I know Gina Cho, I know um, Moon, I know John and Alex, I was just getting to know. These are folks that I knew on Twitter. And, and then I came across a post from, um, from Alex and it talked about how they started this new entity called Start here, HQ, and it's a th I think it's uh, a way for lawyers to go and get help with designing their stuff, and a lot of really, really good stuff, very, very cool stuff. I, re I highly recommend it. If you're on Twitter, go to Start Here HQ, connect with them, and see what they're doing. Um, and, but here is the story. This is from Alex. I co-founded Start Here HQ with three amazing individuals. What's, the thing that was really amazing to her was that all of them met on Twitter. This is the power of connections. This is the power of social media. And this is what you should do at a very minimum, right? You don't have to go into like strategies that go that expand beyond the page. You, you just think about how you want to build relationships. I put this slide in to, just, to, just to identify how many platforms there are. But one of the things I would say is don't try to be on every platform. Identify just the, with a few that, or maybe even one or two that you think would bring you the best value 
meaning that's where your clients reside. That's where the relationships that you want to create um, um, occur. So we are, okay, so I have about another five minutes to go um, or so before we um, leave some time for questions. And by the way, you know, even though we wouldn't have a ton of time for questions, um, if you if you enter a question and I'll um, I'll ask Stephanie to send them to me and I'll try to email each one of you back with an answer. I just want to touch you really briefly. So organic social media is great. It's great for building relationships. It's great for putting your name out there, and it's great for expand um, for for putting some of your own information out there also and for curating and all that stuff that we just talked about. But it's not a bad idea to add social media, um, a little bit of paid social to the mix. So in other words, if you, for instance, if you put out a blog post and you post it on Twitter and you post it on, um, on Facebook and you post it on LinkedIn, and by the way, someone would say, well, why post it on all of these different channels? Because you know, you, you're not probably yet sure where your audience rely. Um, um, is hanging out, and these will this will give you an opportunity to identify where they're hanging out based on your interactions and your reach. But you could start by boosting a post right on Facebook for like fifty bucks. You you're, you're able to 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 identify where you want this post to go to, the kind of audience you want it to reach, and or you can place an ad right. And and when you're placing an ad, you have all kinds of different options to choose from. You can create a custom audience. That custom audience can be layered on, let's say, a spreadsheet that you brought, um, that you uploaded from, from your list of contacts. Now that you can then identify when they visited your website by placing a pixel from Facebook on your website. And Facebook will be like, oh, OK, we can retarget the people that, were, that visited a page on your website in a Facebook ad. Yes, yes, folks, it can get a little creepy, but it's also very useful. Um, and all, of course, all of this leads into your thought leadership platform, right? I mean, you've done, you've done the work, right? You've created the content. You've, you, you've created, um, not just created the content, but you've followed a strategy and followed a plan. And in addition to that content, you've used social media in very, very meaningful ways. Um, now you've created, I like to call um, thought leadership and, 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 and niching your practice in order to achieve a level of thought leadership is very important. But what I really want to come to, come to is this before we close out. And that is what some people are now referring to its software concept, which is your minimal viable product, right, or MVP. You've adopted it to um, content for min minimal viable audience. Through all of your efforts, you've now created an audience that, that you can test things out with, right? You get feedback from. Um, you, you get um, opportunities to build new services or build an application. Um, you get to create new practice areas. Um, you get to test it out um, with a very active audience. I wish I could spend some more time with this. If you have any any um, questions on this, please let me know. I'd be glad to, to talk a little bit more about it, and also to point you to some really useful information on it. Here is an example from Twitter. So I mentioned Ed Walters before. Someone put out this, right? Everyone's talking, oh, robots are coming for, a jo for our jobs, um, robot lawyering, all this kinds of stuff. And we should not feel threatened by robots, by chat box, right? If you have this minimal viable audience, you're able to test out these things. You're like, OK, maybe I need to build an application for this person. Um, maybe I need to um, create an, another practice area or a completely separate practice area or, or a related practice area. You're able to get feedback. You're able to put out some information out there and say, let me know what I'm doing um, and create it that way. So there are three takeaways that I'd like um, from this, three simple take takeaways. Identify up to 10 keywords, not more than that or phrases that you think are most related to your client needs. Create an editorial calendar in Google Spreadsheets and map out um, the weekly content based on uh, some of those column ideas that I, that I mentioned before. And then for social media, identify folks. It could be 10, 15, 20, 50 people. I have a private Twitter list um, with 200, 
over 200 people, maybe 250 people who have identified that folks I want to follow and I want to engage with. Um, so if I don't have time to just scroll through my Twitter feed, I go to that. Identify 20 people that you want to follow them, connect with them, tweet about them, tweet their stuff. Um, maybe even on Facebook. I know Kevin and Keith is big on that. Identify them on Facebook. That's another level of like leveling up your relationship on there. And um, and then hey, if you need if you if you need someone to to knock these ideas off of or or track your progress or let me know how you're doing, just let me know. All right. All right. You know what, Stephanie and and everyone, sorry to hurry up at the end there, but um, we have some time for questions. Yes, we do. Um, and thank you so much, Tim. That was really, really informative. Uh, for those of you who have to leave us now, please take note of three things. When you close your webinar, that five question survey I mentioned will pop up. It just takes 30 seconds to answer those questions. And we enter you to win the $100 Amazon gift card. So we give those away at every webinar. And if you are the Florida Bar member, note your course number which is 2713R, so you self-report that. We don't provide a certificate. And you're gonna receive an email tomorrow with a link to the My Case blog where you'll find these slides, the webinar recording and a recap, and the Amazon gift card winner. And Tim, we have a ton of questions. So we won't get to them all today, but I'm gonna send these over to you to answer. For sure. Um, awesome. but We'll start off with our first one, which is, our firm is very old school and it's not yet on board with social media. We're going to be updating our website, which needs all the help it can get. But so starting from the bare minimum, where is the best place to start? So one of the things that you should do, and it seems as though you are that person, whenever, if you have like opposition or not really um, a lot of passion or energy around um, trying to get going with the stuff, including websites and blog, you you should identify one person who is the evangelist. It's, it's super, super important, or else nothing will, will ever get done. This is also true for technology and for whatever else, practice management, like um, uh, like my case, if you want my, ca my case in your firm, identify an evangelist who really knows the usefulness of it. And if you're that person, a, a good place to start is with an audit. Um, you should identify and audits can be of your um, your website, which can be a digital marketing audit to include SEO. It can include your competitors. Um, and then you can go with a content audit, say, OK, well, this is what you're doing with blogging. That can also be compared to your comp um, competitors. Um, and the same thing with social media. So there are some tools out there that, um, that are some paid tools out there that can help you with an SEO audit. But for a more comprehensive audit, you might need to contact someone to just like, run an audit for you and then maybe have a meeting with them. If you, if you have any questions about this, I'd be more than happy to follow up with you on it. We do audits here all the time. OK, great. Um, and our next question, how do you deal with negative feedback from social media users, like negative reviews and comments? Oh, gosh. So when you get a negative, that's an opportunity, right? A neg so there are, so I should, I should qualify that there are there are trolls that all they, that who exist only and a lot of these are bots too that exist only to make your life miserable so those you just unfollow and you just don't even bother with them it's not gonna it's, it's not gonna make a difference but when you get a negative review if you get ne negative feedback it's an opportunity to win that person over um, I whenever if I see something negative you know I try to stay away you if you do if you show your personality if you do something if you talk about things that are controversial, if you talk about politics or whatever it is that you do online, if you feel the need to do that, you're always going to have some negative feedback. When you get some negative feedback, it, it, it sort of means that at least you're engaging, you're doing something meaningful and not just posting links to something in a mind-numbing way, right? So if, some, if someone posts something negative about you or someone engages in something negative, Reach out to them, tweet it, say, start a conversation. Um, you will know pretty soon if they are really interested in having a conversation or if they're just out there to make people's lives miserable and then you don't deal with them. But yeah, view it as an opportunity to engage and see if you can change their mind. Then they become your biggest evangelizer. 
I love that. So turn a negative into a positive. Absolutely. Great. Um, okay. Well, Tim, we that went by so quickly, and we do have more questions, which I'll send over to you so you can answer for everyone. But um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and to you, Tim, for a fantastic webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks. Bye-bye.